second speaker of the afternoon, if I may please. Can I introduce our second speaker of the afternoon, which is Peter Bustrati. Um, Peter is an Associate Professor of History of Education at the Research Unit of Education, Culture and Society of the Faculty of Psychology and Educational Sciences at KU Leuven, um, which is in Belgium. In his research, he focuses on the history of rehabilitation, the role played by emotions in the history of education, the educational history of prevention in the context of leprosy, polio and AIDS and HIV, and the historical links between art, education and disability. He's just co-authored a book on the history of Belgian infant soldiers during the Great War, which has a Dutch and French title, which Peter, I think, is just about to tell us. And he's now working on a publication that will focus on the history of Belgian disabled veterans in the interwar period. And um, Peter is going to um, present his presentation commemorating the disabled soldier Towers from the Unknown. So, Peter, thank you for coming on to the this is done. It's really good family, <laughs> and um, you know, over to you. Thank, thank you very much. much. Uh, and uh, thanks for the invitation. I really uh, mm. uh, enjoy being here, and uh, it's, oh. uh, it's actually quite an honour to, uh, to have been able to come over from uh, from Leuven, next to Brussels, to, 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 to London, the centre of the world, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, <I'm here> so. <laughs> so I'm indeed going to tell you a little bit about uh, tales from the unknown, and before that, I thought it was not uninteresting to introduce myself a little more. Uh, you have already enumerated very eloquently my uh, uh, research interests, so I'm not going to uh, 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 repeat that. But uh, what I wanted to underline perhaps is uh, the fact that I am a co-founder of the Disability History Lecture Series uh, in Leuven. Uh, those uh, series are recorded and you can uh, access them by clicking on the following link. Uh, no, you cannot click it here, but uh, uh, you can write down the... the the link it's disability history lecture series dot wordpress.com uh, and besides that I'm also co-organizing each year uh, the Leuven Disability Film Festival and this year we will celebrate our fifth anniversary uh, and uh, we have entitled this edition limited uh, edition and we will feature films like the census uh, turtles can fly uh, the Blind, a documentary of a Dutch, uh, very famous uh, documentary maker, uh, etc. So, if you uh, feel like it, uh, you can join. Uh, perhaps we can do something together uh, once. Uh, I really hope that that would be the case. Uh, why am I sitting here? Actually, I received a, an email from uh, Richard Reeser, uh, who had heard about a conference I organized together with uh, Julie Anderson at Martina Salvante in Ipers uh, in Belgium uh, uh, between November the 4th and November uh, the 16th, 2013. And we gathered there, I think it were more than 20 researchers dealing with the history of disabled veterans. And Kate uh, was also uh, uh, there. So, uh, uh, if you would like to know more about this conference, you also can. Uh, go to the following link commemorating the disabled soldier dot wordpress dot com. But I thought today it would be more appropriate to focus not on the conference, not on what came out of it, because we are uh, in the process of publishing a special issue at uh, First World War uh, Studies. But I thought it better to focus on a central question uh, and today, and that is the following one Can we encounter? Persons with disabilities in the way the Great War was and still is commemorated in Belgium, Flanders. And actually, I have to admit immediately that this is a kind of a rhetorical question. I mean, the answer definitely is yes. Uh, and I want to uh, argue that it is yes by means of four very particular case studies. First of all, the grave of the unknown soldier in Brussels. Secondly, the blind Finch case. Thirdly, a German uh, initiative, uh, the Anti-War Museum, and finally, and that actually comes uh, to the question that was posed to Kate uh, uh, just in the, in the final session, uh, do these soldiers still play a role in the way children and grandchildren of the Great War commemorate their father or grandfather? 
So those are the four case studies I would like to uh, touch upon very briefly, if we have time, because uh, uh, it runs very quickly. And so you have to stop me if, uh, if I'm uh, going all the time. <laughs> <laughs> so the first case study, the grave of the unknown soldier. What you uh, see here on the slide is a postcard of the Congress Column in Brussels. That was a monument erected in order to celebrate uh, the so many years anniversary of Belgium's uh, independence. And this monument actually became very uh, famous after the war because it also was used in order to bury the unknown soldier, the unknown Belgian soldier. As in many other countries, uh, one decided shortly after the uh, armistice that a monument should be erected or be reused in order to bury soldiers who died on the battlefield but whose remains actually did not were retrieved. Uh, so those soldiers who were buried over there, they did not know uh, who they uh, were or they knew how they were but they didn't find their bodies because they were buried under the mud in Ivers or on another side of the front. What is interesting is that uh, when you ask yourself the question, actually, how do we imagine these unknown soldiers? I think you immediately come to an image of a perfect soldier. And that is due partly, I think, to the monument that is referred to here in the image. If you ask yourself, how does this unknown soldier look like, then you will not portray him in a fragmented way, but you will see him as a hero, as one who died on the battlefield in order to fight for the liberty of occupied Belgium. So it's a kind of a, a really sound and, and whole uh, image, an image of, of wholeness. Uh, and so, in my opinion, actually the unknown soldier is not so unknown, because we have a very clear image of how he looks like. The real unknown soldier is the one who actually pointed towards this unknown soldier. And in order to explain that a little bit more, I have to go back to 1922, to the ceremony one set up in order to bury the unknown soldier. What did the Belgian government do at that time? They asked for several persons to send remains of Belgian unknown soldiers from all over the front to Bruges, and then they put before the train station in Bruges five coffins with remains of unknown Belgian soldiers. Mm. And then someone was asked to point towards the coffin that afterwards would be sent to Brussels in order to be buried in this monument as the real and only unknown soldier. The interesting thing now is that the one who was asked in order to point towards the right coffin, he was a blind veteran. He was Maurice Hasebroek. Maurice Hasebroek was one of the 88 blind veterans Belgian army counted after 1918. And that is really interesting because I think behind the unknown soldier, there is a soldier who is even more unknown because nobody today knows about Maurice Hasebroek who played in a crucial role in order to pinpoint towards the right and only unknown soldier. Maurice Hasebroek, uh, he was a really famous guy throughout his life. Actually, when he was buried himself in 1956, uh, the church was too small in order to gather all the audience in Hasebroek. And actually, he was uh, from the same village where I was born uh, in, in 1979. That's, <laughs> that's not important. <coughs> Uh, so I think that that's a first really interesting case study of how disabled soldiers, they played a huge and central role in the commemoration of disabled uh, unknown soldiers uh, in uh, Belgium. Aww. And just to say a little bit more about Belgian disabled soldiers, uh, the thing is that Belgium was occupied and uh, the Belgian government set up uh, rehabilitation, rehabilitation institutes in the Netherlands, in the United Kingdom, and in the north of France, as well as in occupied Belgium. So in all those different geographies, you could find institutes where one rehabilitated uh, Belgian soldiers. Uh, I did research on the French uh, rehabilitative institute in Port where 
at one particular time, more than 3,000 uh, of them were uh, gathered and uh, rehabilitated. If we have time, perhaps I can uh, say a little more about uh, that in the discussion. In, on this slide, you can see uh, what is Hazebu. Uh, I have been able to retrieve uh, the archives who belonged to himself, as well as I have been able to do an interview with the niece of Maurice Hazebu, who lived for a very long time together with him, and who actually guided him from uh, Asselbrook, the village where he lived, to Bruges and back uh, by guiding him uh, and so on. Maurice Hazebrook, just uh, as an anecdote, he, uh, he kind of refused to use uh, his white cane, and so that is why this particular image is so uh, important because this is the only image where you see Maurice Hasbrook using his white cane. Actually, he kind of refused to, to do so uh, for the rest of his days. Okay, so that's for the first case study. Disabled uh, soldiers played a really important role in the way Belgian government commemorated the dead and the unknown soldiers. Second case, the blind finch. Very remarkable story. Uh, what you see here on the slide are two pictures. Uh, on the left picture you see a very innocent and little uh, bird called a finch. Uh, uh, I was told that here in uh, England you also have this kind of bird. It's a bullfinch. It's a? A bullfinch. Yeah. yeah. I think actually this is an orchid finch. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I was told. <laughs> and on the right side of the slide you see a very typical Flemish finch owner. He uh, looks a bit angry, but that is our character, uh, I suppose. And so let me tell you a little bit about uh, finch sport, uh, because that is a local sport which is now recognized officially as cultural heritage in Flanders. Uh, finch sport is a sport that is practiced uh, on Sunday mornings, uh, and all the finch owners in the west of Flanders, they come together and then they put the cages in which they keep the, the finches before them. They have black sticks and white pieces of prey. And then what uh, is important is that they sit over there for an hour and they count the number of times the finches sing suscuit. And so the, the birds, they can sing up to 600, 700 times uh, suscuit. And so in the end, the one who sings the most suscuit he is the winner. What is interesting now is that in the 19th century, the sport actually was almost uniquely uh, practiced with blinded finches. In the 17th to 16th century, we can find already uh, texts that say, okay, when you blind the birds, then they are going to sing, to sing more. And so in order to uh, compete uh, better with each other, they blinded uh, the finches. And how did they do that? Well, they catch the finch, they kept it in a very dark cage in order to habituate the, the, the bird to the darkness. Then they pulled the bird out, they took a piece of glowing iron, and they gradually approached it to the eyelids of the bird. So in order to protect its eyes, the bird closes it. And then, due to the warmth, it sticks together, and then the bird turns out to be blind. Very interesting now is that persons with visual disabilities in Flanders, they have been very active in promoting a, a prohibition towards the practice of blinding the finches. Uh, in my research, I have come across a petition of uh, blind pupils of uh, the Blind Institute in Brussels in 1901, who said, okay, this is a very cruel practice that actually does not fit within a civilized country as Belgium. And so they sent that petition to the parliament, it was discussed, but in the end it uh, did not succeed. It. And uh, the law in order to prevent uh, this particular cruel practice was not voted. And one had to wait, according to the historiography, to 1928 in order to have such a law that pro it prohibited the blinding of the finches. What is now important, and here we again turn to the disabled soldiers, is that in the existing historiographies of finch sport, it continuously is said that in 1921 a march would have been organized 
by blinded veterans in order to ask for a prohibition, a legal prohibition, against the blinding of the veterans. So that is uh, something you find in every book on the history of Finnish sport. Actually, what did I find when I went to the archives? I did not find anything. I cannot find a single trace of this march of blinded veterans. Very strange, isn't it? I went to the journals published in Brussels. I took a look uh, at the journals published by uh, blind persons in Belgium. Uh, I went to uh, all the archives dealing with uh, blind organizations and I could not find a single trace of this blind march. I could not find it either in the discussions that actually led to the prohibition in 1928. So that is very intriguing to me. Why does one continuously refer to this so-called march of blinded veterans? Whereas, if you, as a historian, go to the sources, you do not find it. So it's a really intriguing way of how disabled veterans are being used in order to commemorate not only the disabled veterans themselves, but also the establishment of this particular kind of law. So that is the second case which intrigues me a lot, and I think uh, provokes a lot of uh, a lot of a lot of questions. Okay. I am going to move on to my third case study, and actually it touches you upon uh, also many of the things that you just uh, said, uh, Kate, mm -hmm. because it deals with how disabled veterans are being used in propaganda, mm -hmm. but not in war propaganda, but in anti-war propaganda. So we will now turn to the interwar period and to Germany, where in the 20s, you had a very important uh, person, an intellectual, uh, Ernst Friedrich, who is really known uh, for his publication in 1924, I think, uh, Krieg den Krieg, War to War, Oorlog aan den Oorlog, Guerre à la Guerre. The publication was immediately translated into a number of languages, and uh, Ernst Friedrich, uh, he became really well known as pacifist, and uh, he, among other things, also established an anti-Kriegs museum. Uh, this anti-Kriegs museum was uh, really famous in Berlin in the 20s, and in the beginning of the 30s, when uh, Adolf Hitler seized power in Germany, uh, he was forced to close the museum. And why was that? Because, of course, Adolf Hitler had other plans with Europe. Uh, but also because in the vitrine of the anti-war museum you could see, you could look at images of facially wounded German and Austrian soldiers. Really shocking figures. I didn't dare to project them here because I also think that some ethical issues are involved in using and reusing those kind of pictures. So I decided deliberately not to put them in the PowerPoint. But also here you see that Images of disabled persons, they play a very particular role in the way one commemorates the war, or not commemorates the war, and how disabled soldiers are being used in order to uh, sustain and legitimize a particular political stance. And in this case, this is pacifism. Uh, so I think that is another very intriguing uh, case study in order to explore how to understand the way disabled soldiers were commemorated also in the interwar uh, period. Actually, what is important for me uh, is that uh, the museum, after it was closed in 1936, it moved to Belgium and it traveled around all the important cities in Belgium, Boston, Brussels, Ghent, between 1936 and 1939. What I'm doing now is uh, having a look at all the journals that were published in those years uh, the right-wing journals as well as the left-wing journals in order to see whether something was written uh, in those journals about the museum and in order perhaps also to discover what the impact of the images of the facially wounded soldiers on that contemporary population, Belgian population, uh, was back at that time. So here you see a picture of the anti Kriegs museum when it was active in the 20s and then after, that is also interesting to know, after Hitler seized power and the museum was closed down, they just erased 
anti. <laughs> so it became a Kriegs museum. Uh, Can you imagine that? <laughs> uh, so, just uh, for the record. Finally, and I'm not sure how many. Yeah? yeah. Okay. So, finally, I would like to refer to uh, an ongoing research project uh, that I just uh, started after uh, we gathered in Ipers because I became very inspired by the keynote uh, Professor Michael Rober gave at that conference. And he referred in that keynote to interviews he did with children and grandchildren uh, of disabled soldiers uh, within uh, the UK context, of course. So I decided, uh, let's see whether I am able to find also children, grandchildren of the Belgian mutilated soldiers uh, back in, uh, in, in my home uh, country. And actually I did. Uh, for the moment I have 30 persons, uh, male and female, children and grandchildren, uh, whom I have interviewed or with whom I have planned uh, some interviews. And the aim of my particular research is what actually is the impact of war-related impairments on the family life of the disabled soldier, and in particular on the way the child, the grandchild, actually experienced the presence of this mutilated disabled father or grandfather. Uh, and just to uh, uh, say a little bit about the results that already came out of these interviews, I would like to refer to uh, the case of Alberic van der Stallen. And Alberic van der Stallen is the son of an amputated Belgian uh, soldier. Uh, and one of the things that he uh, told to me in the interview is that Actually, he was kind of traumatized by the prosthesis that his father had to wear because those prostheses, they were very heavy and very uneasy to handle. Oh. And so the son was every morning and every evening, uh, he had to help his father in order to uh, put the prosthesis on and then afterwards to put it off. And then what the son told me in that interview is that when he nowadays goes to a kind of flea market, is that a correct mm -hmm. word? Uh, and he sees uh, these kind of artifacts that also shoemakers use, it's a kind of wooden shoe, that it kind of revives all the memories and all the experiences that he had with his disabled and amputated uh, father. So he immediately uh, remembers everything uh, that went on during those days, and especially uh, the fact that his father, during the night, he screamed a lot uh, due to the fact that he experienced a lot of pain in, uh, in that period. Okay, that's for the fourth case, case study. I will come to my conclusion and then hopefully to an interesting uh, discussion with all of you. And so I think that for sure, the history of disabled veterans, it provides innumerable opportunities for persons with disabilities themselves to fight existing prejudices. But in my opinion, it is also important to say that those histories, they also lead to surprising stories that can trigger general issues of commemoration, of ecology and sustainability, regarding museum and education, and issues of intergenerationality. That is a very difficult word. <laughs> Okay, so I would say that what I had been talking about are tales from the unknown for everyone. Not only for persons with disabilities, not only for able-bodied persons, but for everybody. And I think that is an important issue that we as disability historians have to address when we are looking towards the 21st century. So, if you have any questions, suggestions, comments, uh, and in case you would be able to read Dutch or French, uh, this is the frontispiece, the cover of my latest book. Uh, it is entitled Mutilated Silence, the Remain to Stilte, and it deals both with the history of shell shock soldiers as well as physically disabled soldiers uh, within the Belgian Flemish context. So my email address uh, is also on the slide, it's just pieter.verstraten uh, at ppw.kru.be but I'm here until 7 o'clock then I have my Eurostar back to Brussels so, thank you very much thank you very much
thank you for coming all the way over to London and, you know, oh. family day back in Belgium, so thank you. Like, uh. Can we open the floor up to any questions, thoughts or comments on Peter's presentation that you, you may wish to give to Peter? Any thoughts? Uh, yeah, that was a really, really fascinating presentation. Uh, I mentioned a, a book earlier, um, before you arrived, um, about um, the portrayal of uh, disabled ex-soldiers in the First World War in German culture. And um, the Christ Museum you mentioned, I believe that there was a, an exhibition in the front window of photographs uh, which was attacked by the police and closed down by the authorities on the grounds that this was obscene and it was, because it was so graphic, mm. it was seen as being um, um, uncivilised uh, and uh, abhorrent to present these images of the war, in other words to remind people of the brutal reality of the war uh, for the German public and um, th th that was something I found really interesting because um, as I was saying earlier, there are a lot of German art you find very explicit and very graphic uh, depictions of the injuries in war um, as, as an anti-war weapon in fact. Mm -hmm. And I wonder how much uh, that was, you, you found that true in, in, in the stuff that you're reading about in, that, in researching in Belgium. Mm -hmm. Well, that, that is something that I have to explore uh, within the next few months, uh, as so, which I hope to find in the Belgian newspapers that were published uh, around that time. Whether the exhibition of those same images had the same impact as they had in, in, in the German culture, and which actually, indeed, you refer to it correctly, to, to the closing down of, of the museum in 1933, uh, uh, I think. Yeah. And afterwards, actually, it also led to the fact that Ernst Friedrich he was uh, imprisoned for more than three years uh, in, in a German prison uh, due to the fact that he uh, dared to show the consequences of what was more and more considered as to be a romantic war because uh, one tried uh, from all kinds of sides to uh, uh, warm the German population up for the war that was uh, in the making. Uh, I would say. So an anti-Kriegsmuseum didn't completely fit that, that picture. And so in order to uh, get rid of all those uh, uh, critical voices, we well, decided to, to shut the, the museum down. Yeah, absolutely. Now what is interesting is that, uh, but it, 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 it takes some, some effort to do that. But that those images, they circulated enormously throughout the world. I would say that those were the first global images mm. of disability back then. Mm. I think it's really interesting because the book, actually I refer to it, uh, and it was published in German, in French, in Dutch, as well as it was in Spanish. So it went through all the different regions of the world. What I did not uh, yet discover is whether it also was discovered in Russian or uh, that I do not know. Was it in English? It was in English, yeah. Also. So I, I think that that is something worth to explore. How those kind of globalization of the image of disability impacted on the population that lived back then. Uh, okay, so it's, uh, what was the book's English name that you were asked to? Sorry? The book's English name? Uh, war, to war. war to War. War to War? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Gentlemen there, they uh, Thank you very much. Um, it, just a comment, Lord, in a question, but maybe it's generated into a question. Let's see. It just reminded me of the work of, of some of the things you said, but it reminded me of Alf Morris from the UK context right. and having a father who, who was a uh, you know, disabled veteran and then the campaign he was involved in to bring about legislation and quality rights and recognition of. Uh, the effects of war uh, within the UK context and the struggle for the Disability Discrimination Act uh, to come into to play, really. Just thought to just. Okay. After that is what was the name? Alf oh, Morris. Alf Morris. 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 <laughs> he died last year. Mm -hmm. you know, but again, he's, he's worked for campaigning for disabled veterans' rights. It's been a theme throughout his life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, just, yeah. yeah. 
But uh, just also to connect to the, to, the, to the presentation you gave this morning, you, you of course also have Sassoon as a very famous uh, uh, pacifist who, who also suffered from, from shell shock. Mm -hmm. In that condition, uh, distributed his anti-war thoughts and actually they were dismissed just to the fact that he was considered as a as a psychiatrically mm -hmm. ill person. So that also was a kind of way of dealing with critical forces. Mm -hmm. That would be very, very interesting to see how uh, both within the, 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 the English context as well as in the, in the German context, how one made use of disabled persons in order to uh, promote a particular kind of political uh, agenda. One of the I'm interested in Alf Morris's work is uh, you know, being uh, brought up in the northwest of England, in, in the typical working class family, and then seeing the effects of disabling affect the family. And I was particularly interested in how you know, the interviews with uh, children and grandchildren. And certainly the, the wider effects of disarmament on society more broadly, mm -hmm. uh, and certainly some interesting parallels. Uh, and in having to go, I mean, I don't valorise the grammar school system, but in having to go to a grammar school and then become an MP, etc., and battle for you know the issues that you just uh, explained. But yes, yeah, thank you very much. One of the things that keeps coming back in the interviews is that the disabled oh. uh, soldiers. Uh, due to the fact that they became disabled in the war, they kind of become more sensitive for the importance of being educated. And so they continuously stressed and emphasized the role of education to their children and grandchildren. And that is really intriguing. Uh, I was trained as an educator, so that is of course also why I am interested in, in that particular aspect. It's, it's, yeah. okay. I'm, I'm interested in what the Belgian newspapers were able to publish in the way of images of in their soldiers, given the Belgians under occupation. Was there much freedom? I wouldn't be able to say. Oh, okay. No, I haven't looked into that. Right. Yeah. Because I found quite a lot in the British newspapers. Yeah. I, 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 would, yeah. I would guess that there was not a lot of freedom because, of course, Ger uh, Belgium was occupied by the Germans. And so every image or text that wants to be published in a Belgian newspaper had to go through the German censorship. Yeah, yeah. And so uh, that, I, I think, not much images of Belgian disabled soldiers mm -hmm. will have been appear, will have appeared in, yeah. in those journals yeah. between 1914 and 1918. Mm -hmm. And if they did so, I think they fitted within a particular yeah, political... The message would be interesting to find yeah. out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Gentlemen, you had your hand you had your hand up for a question, didn't you? 